After completing his engineering degree in university, Fernando Angelucci began work in the corporate world to quickly realize that the corporate track was not a good fit. He turned to real estate at the age of 23, and after achieving success inside of 13 short months, he quit his full-time job and began investing in real estate full-time. He was heavily invested in both single-family and multi-family apartment buildings, when after managing for a period, he learned the state where he held his portfolio was too tenant-friendly. After spending nearly a year trying to evict a professional tenant, he decided to pivot and focus on self-storage. In this episode, Fernando shares with us the benefits of self-storage, or as he puts it, the reasons why he prefers to store things versus housing people. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome back to another episode. I am pleased to have on here Mr. Fernando Angelucci. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right. So, Fernando, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and what you're doing in real estate right now? Yeah. So, uh, I'll kind of go all the way from the back, from the beginning. Um, I'm uh, the, the kid of two immigrants to the United States. Uh, they're both from Brazil. They came to the United States kind of with the American dream in mind, you know, go to school, get good grades, go find a good company, work for them for 40, 45 years, and then retire with a pension, right? Um, that didn't work out too well for me. Uh, as soon as I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 16 years old, I knew that I was going to be a business owner. And then by the time I was 19, I knew I was going to do real estate. Uh, I went to school anyway, graduated with an engineering degree, and then immediately uh, started working uh, for a Fortune 50 company and was not satisfied with kind of what was going on um, in my career. So started doing real estate investing uh, at the age of 23. Um, on the side. And then within 13 months, I quit my Fortune 50 job to do real estate full time. And then from there, it kind of went very quickly. I started with single family wholesaling, then went to multifamily rentals, um, raising capital from partners I had. Uh, Then we started flipping single family homes, um, flipping apartment buildings. And then from there, we finally found self-storage and that's what we've been doing ever since. And I can go into some reasons why I switched from multifamily rentals and single family rentals into self-storage in a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, that actually sounds great. Why don't we just go ahead and kind of talk about that? Because you and I, before we started recording, we were talking about self-storage. So, you know, I'm very curious to know like why, why the transition? Yeah. So uh, I'm based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, We invest in, self-storage nationally but before we looked at self-storage we were buying apartment buildings in the greater chicago area and the problem with chicago is that it is an extremely tenant friendly state uh the local municipalities are extremely tough on landlords they look at us like the big bad wolf and so what happens is uh, not only being in cook county but also just in illinois in general anytime that there's an issue it's always on the landlord to prove that the tenant did something wrong, which causes the delays and evictions, right? So perfect example, we had a tenant um, that when we bought the property, we inherited the tenant and we found out, you know, within a month of, of buying the property that the rent rolls we got were inaccurate and that she hadn't actually paid for six months. So we immediately started the eviction process. Um, But she was a professional. She was a professional tenant and she knew what she was doing and uh, was able to drag out the eviction for another eight months. So now you have a, a, it was basically all in all a 13 month saga to get this one tenant out. And not only was she an issue, but then she started kind of spreading misinformation to the other people in the apartment building and trying to get them to not pay. And so that's all a huge issue. And then because we're in Chicago, you know, certain periods of the time uh, of the year, you can't even evict people if it's too cold out. So she knew all these games to play and it it ended up costing us quite a bit, a bit of money. So at that point, we were already, I think that was our 39th or 40th unit as far as multifamily goes. And I started looking for something else. And that's when about five years ago or so, uh, we found self-storage. And the, re- the, the very first thing that I loved about self-storage versus apartment buildings is as opposed to being 
guided by tenant landlord law. It's guided by lien law, which is a completely separate, different, you know, set of laws that's extremely favorable towards the owner of the property as opposed to the quote unquote tenants or residents, right? So with self-storage, the difference between the quote unquote eviction process or the auction process is that if you don't pay your rent, we give you a five day notice. If you still don't pay, then we can start the auction process. Uh, we put some ads in the local legal newspaper uh, two weeks apart. And by usually the 45th day, we hold the auction and we recoup all of our lost rents and we get a new tenant in the same day, right? The turnover is just taking a, you know, a broom and, and, and dusting out the, the, you know, the dust before you turn it around on the same day, as opposed to with an apartment building, that eviction process, like I said, could take eight months. Um, then, you know, if the tenant was mad enough, they could have done a ton of damage. And now the turn is going to be two, three months that your unit's on, you know, downtime and you're going to have to spend five to $6,000 for paint and rehab and carpet cleaning, depending on, you know, the extent of the damage that was caused. So that was right off the bat. As soon as I saw that, I was like, I'm sold. Uh, let's get into it. And actually over my time operating these types of units, uh, I've actually found nine other reasons why I love self-storage over multifamily or just typical residential rentals, right? So I don't like, I like storing things, not people, right? Because then it, <laughs> all this liability sheds away from you and the process of dealing with non-payment is so much easier. So you mentioned uh, that self-storage is guided by lien law. Now, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're not a lawyer, right? But if you could just, and that's the caveat, everybody, you know, but can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what you mean when you say lien law and how that applies to self-storage? Yeah. So let's look at multifamily. Multifamily, when somebody stays in your place, there's not only an ex expressed warranty of habitation, but there's also an implied warranty of habitation, right? So that causes a lot of liability issues for you as an owner. But on top of that, now, when somebody doesn't pay, it's the difference between them not having a place to stay and them having a place to stay, right? So you, you're, you're, and I'm going to use storage terms, you're storing a person, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. With self-storage, not only is there no expressed warranty of habitation, there's none that are implied either. So we are storing your stuff and your stuff only. And so how it works is when somebody puts their stuff into one of our storage units, we automatically get, in exchange for giving them a place to put their stuff, we automatically get a lien on the stuff inside of the storage unit. And if they don't pay, we can exercise our right to auction off those materials to satisfy our lien or any back due payments that are owed to us, right? So instead of us dealing with people, we're dealing with stuff. So the liability is shifted to the owner of the stuff and not the owner of the property. Oh, okay. And you said usually this, from the time that you issue the notice, um, you said usually it's about what, like 45 days until you yeah, can actually turn it over? Yeah. Depending on the state, it's anywhere between 30 to 60 days. Um, that's pretty ubiquitous uh, throughout the United States. And so the process is pretty simple. So we give them written notice saying, hey, you're back due. This is how much you need to pay to get caught up. If not, we're going to auction off your stuff. We give them a grace period to respond to that letter. Um, if they don't make any type of, you know, reach out to work a payment program or something like that, then we immediately send it to an auction website. And to do that, we have to put two notices, putting the public on notice that we're going to be holding an auction in 30 days. And we just have to list what the unit number is, the location of that, um, the location of that uh, unit, as well as a couple photos of the unit opened, right? Uh, so they can see, and then people start making auctions. And, you know, unfortunately, it's not like storage wars on TV, because we do all of our auctions online to get a, a greater buyer pool. Um, but it's the same process. And so to put the, the public on notice, we put out two circulations in the local legal newspaper that just says this tenant at this unit number, at this address is going to be auctioned on this day. We run that twice for two weeks. Um, and then at that point, we hold the auction and just take the, the highest bidder. 
Now, quick question, something that just kind of came to mind. <clears throat> uh, let's say like if, I mean, let's say like if they owed you guys like three or $400 or something like that. Um, and through the auction, you receive, let's say like 2000 or $3,000, right? So what happens with that $3,000? Right. So the $3,000, it's all applied in to, to any back due payments, any late fees. And then once someone goes into the actual auction process, there's a bunch of other fees that we charge on top of that, right? So there's going to be a lien fee. There's going to be an auction fee. There's going to be the time for somebody to go out there and do all this work. So if say somebody owes us 400 bucks, on a unit and we get 2000, there's probably gonna be another 300 to $400 on top of that and just fees alone that they agree to when they sign the lease, when they store their stuff. Anything, if there's any overage left over at that point, depending on the state, it has different laws. But in most days what happens is it goes to a, a state unclaimed fund, right? We let the person know that there's an overage and that they can go collect it at the, the state fund. If it's not collected within a timely fashion, depending on the state, one to seven years, then it goes back to the storage facility owner. So they are entitled, just like in a foreclosure auction, if there's an overage, the, the overage goes to the tenant or the, the, the borrower, I guess, if in a foreclosure setting. Mm -hmm. But that's very rare, right? Usually... We, we set up our auctions in a way that we, the stuff in the, in the actual unit itself is always going to be auctioned somewhere at, we'll either take a slight loss or we're, we're pretty much breaking even. It's very rare that there's an overage. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, before we got on the call about the historicals that you were looking into and you had some information you wanted to share with our listeners. So can we look at, can we talk about that right now? Sure. So I like to look at this over a long period of time and then also focus down on a shorter period of time when recessions are, are happening. Uh, self storage is a very recession resilient asset class or counter cyclical as some would say. Um, and that's because we serve people that are in transition. So let's look at 2007 to 2009 time period. That's when a lot of real estate investors were going and stock investors were going through some tough times. So during that time, the S&P 500 lost 22% of its value. Um, if you were in mortgages, hard money loans, or just conventional mortgages, you lost about 19 and a half percent. Multifamily, and now this is all data based on REITs, right? So for smaller investors, it may have had a, a more pronounced or a less pronounced effect. Uh, from the REIT sector, multifamily lost about 6.7%. I know a lot of multifamily investors during that time lost much larger uh, uh, drops in value um, than that 6.7%. During that same period of time, self-storage lost 3.8%. So almost a blip. You know, If your rents dropped 3.8% during that time, you'd, you'd still be doing pretty well. Right. So you, what people say is, OK, it's got less risk. So that must mean that also has less reward. And what we found is that's actually not true. So if you look at 1994 to 2017, so 23, 24 years, uh, you look at all those sectors again. S&P 500 went up by seven and a half percent. That's the average return. Um, Mortgage, 11%. Multifamily up 13%. So that's pretty good. Uh, but self-storage was up 17%. So people say, okay, you know, an extra 4% increase in valuation. Well, that's 4% compounding, right? So let's look at actual numbers. If I put $100,000 into multifamily in 1994, that $100,000 would be worth $1.7 in, in 2017. If I put that same $100,000 in self-storage in 1994, in 2017, it would be worth a little over $4 million. So a little over double what your return would have been with multifamily. And that's because that 4% was compounded over that 24 years, 23 or 24 years. So that's one of the reasons I really like it. So it does really well when the economy is doing well because people are buying more stuff and they maybe they're not, you know, upgrading the, the, the square footage that they live in, they're just going to go to one of my facilities, pay an extra hundred bucks for an extra closet, if you will, and store their stuff there. Um, but then the, 
the the opposite is true when we're going through tough times. People are downsizing, so they, you know, they'll go from 2,400 square feet to 1,200 square feet, but they're not going to throw away, you know, the paintings and macaroni, you know, gifts that their kids made them when they were little. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to give away their high value items like, uh, you know, an ATV or a small boat. They're going to put those in storage. So we usually do really well during those those counter cyclical times, right? Um, just in the last four or five weeks, as this whole coronavirus thing has been kind of playing out, our occupancies across all of our self storage facilities have actually increased. And they've increased past historical ceiling levels where most of our facilities would be considered stabilized. So that's one of the things that I really like to look at. And then I also take a look at it from the other side, which is from a credit risk perspective, right? Because as real estate investors, we need leverage to operate. So if, a, if you can get a bank to understand these, these pros and cons of each asset class, then they'll change their lending to you. So if you look at, <clears throat> let's say, 2011 to 2018, okay, and we'll look at default rate by asset class. Um, you look at stuff like multifamily, that was in a, an average default rate of about 4% in 2011. Um, I'm sorry, 15% in 2011 down to maybe 3%, two and a half to 3% in 2018. Self storage during those same periods of time was at 4% default rate in 2011. And by 2017, the default rate was 0.17%, right? Uh, 2000. Uh, January of 18, you're looking at a 0.04% default rate across all self-storage and uh, held across all major banks. Now, not only does it does have a lower default rate than other asset classes to the bank, but it also, once in the rare moon that it actually does default, it also has the lowest loss to the bank per default. So let's look at 1998 to 2017, multifamily on average, Every time there was a default, the bank itself would lose anywhere between three and a half to four and a half percent of the value of the loan. During that time, self storage, those defaults were 0.86% to about one and a half percent loss per default. So, from a bank's perspective, this makes a lot more sense to balance their credit risk. So that's why we're seeing really great loans being offered to us. So for example, I closed on the last three properties I've closed on, I closed with a hundred percent loan to cost loan. Wow. Actually, one of the, the deals actually closed above a hundred percent. I actually walked away from closing with a check for 96,000. So I had a cash out purchase. I mean, I've never heard of a bank doing a cash out purchase on a multifamily property, right? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, we just were wrapping up uh, a portfolio of properties into a fund here in the next month or two. And the debt that was offered to us on that fund is from a life insurance company. 70% loan to cost or loan to value um, at 3.7% interest, 25 year fully amortized. Like, to wow. find me another type of commercial loan that you can get with terms that good, right? It's, it's hard. And that's because life insurance companies, they've been around for 200, 250 years. They know what assets are stable. So in that small portion of their allocated investment that they're, they're allowed to, to put on what they consider riskier investments other than bonds in real estate, they're choosing to put it into self storage because they know it's going to it's going to perform for them. Mm -hmm. Have you seen uh the rates on any of these loans since the uh the onset here of this whole coronavirus? Have you seen the rates increase at all? Cuz I know in uh, the multifamily sector they actually have increased a bit. Yeah, for actually for storage our rates have dropped. So mm -hmm. before coronavirus that uh, that life insurance company, they gave us a 3.8% interest rate quote, and now we're up down to 3.7%. I'm also currently negotiating a ground up development deal um, in Illinois, and there's a bank that's offering us 80% loan to cost on the construction. And that's at, I think, prime plus 1%. Wow. So 
the loans since this coronavirus thing has been coming out, I, I, you know, talking to the bankers that I work with, they've been pulling back on their multifamily office, medical and retail loans. And they've been re-upping on their self storage and mobile home loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. When you said the, the pulling back on like multifamily loans and everything, that seems to be quite consistent with what it is, you know, that that we're seeing and, and can explain partially why it is that the rates actually increased, you know, recently. Um, so you mentioned here too something with the underwriting. So really, I mean, if you're an investor and you're looking at these self storage units, how should an investor go about um, evaluating one of these? Yeah. So the underwriting is is not much more difficult than underwriting a self-storage facility and actually i find it to be a little bit easier just because there's less moving parts so the you know the very first things that we look at we look at basically five things we look at traffic counts on the curb cut and in the main area we look at the demand drivers and the demographics of the the trade area and the reason I say trade area is because self-storage is a very localized business. So, for example, when someone's looking to choose an apartment building, and I'm going to use my local market in Chicago, depending on the pricing, I can, I can go 12 to 15 miles in any direction and still be within the areas that I want to be in to rent an apartment, right? With self-storage, usually people are only going to rent within a one to three mile radius of the self-storage facility because they don't want to drive 25 minutes out of the way to save an extra five bucks a month on the rent. They want something that's close by and is convenient. Um, in urban cores, you're looking at about a one mile trade area. Uh, suburbs, about three miles. And then exurbs and rural areas, you're looking at a five to a 10 mile radius where 90% of your... Um, customers will be coming from. So that's why we look at the, the demand drivers and the de demographics in the local trade area. Number three is we look at a competition study. And number four is we dive deep into that competition study to, to do a supply and demand analysis or to come up with a supply index number. And then the very last thing we do is then we actually look at the property and the financials to see if the property makes sense. So I can kind of touch on each one of those individually. So with traffic counts, because it's a localized business, it's one of those businesses where when you don't need self-storage, self-storage is invisible to you, right? You'll drive past a self-storage facility every day and you won't even notice it. But then the second you need to, to get some self-storage, all of a sudden you start seeing them all over the place, right? And whatever's forefront in mind is usually going to be what they make their choice with. So 40% of our, of our clientele, they find our place just because they were driving past it. The other 60% find it now because of these things, right? Because of cell phones. So with, with self-storage, uh, we want to make sure that we're having heavy traffic counts in front of the property, but then also make sure that we look at the online traffic. If we find a facility that doesn't have a, a online presence, you can't find it on Google Maps, that's going to be a very good contender for us to buy as a value add because the very first thing we can do is just get it out there, right? capture that other 60% that the previous owner was not. Um, then we look at the demand drivers and demographics. So when you look at self storage, you want that self storage to be surrounded by dense residential properties, uh, be it, you know, PUDs, planned unit developments, be it multifamily, be it high rises. Those are all really good things for us. We like to see colleges, right? We like to see military bases. These are all the types of people that are in transition that may need self-storage. Um, next, we look at a competition study. So we choose which one of those trade area radii we want to use, one, three, five, or a 10-mile radius based, to, you know, based on the density of the population in the area. And then we, inside of that circle, we look at all the competitors and we say, okay, what all of these competitors, are they full, you know, and for self storage, we consider full 85 to 90, 90% plus occupancy. Um, if they're all above 90% occupancy, that's a really good sign for us. That means that there's unmet demand in the area and we can either raise supply or raise prices, you know, because it's one of those things you never want to be a hundred percent full with a self storage facility. Cause that means that you're not charging high enough. And you never want to be below 85% because that means you're charging too much or you're, 
your marketing's not on point, people can't find you, right? So once we see that that's a, you know, a good area and the competition is saturated, then we look at something a little bit more technical called the supply index number. It's a ratio and the equation is net rentable square feet of self-storage available in your trade area divided by the population in that trade area. So net rentable square feet per capita, okay? The average equilibrium in the United States is 5.93 or 5.96 net rentable square feet per capita in your trade area. So after we see that the competition study makes sense and we run the supply index number, if it's in the three to five net rentable square foot per, you know, per capita range, that's a really good indicator that there's pent up demand for the storage. And I can come in, buy a property, increase rents, um, potentially even expand the property, double or triple the size of the facility, and then refinance all my cash out, right? Hold it for the long term. And then the, if all those things make sense, then the very last thing that we do is we actually look at the property itself. We'll look at the rent rolls. We'll look at the, you know, the, the NOI that it produces. We look at the expenses to see if there's anywhere in the expenses that we can drop and add value. Um, can we add additional revenue streams? Can I add U-Haul or mailboxes, moving supplies, um, you know, you name it. So it's funny how most people, when they look at, say, multifamily, the very first thing they look at is, let's look at the property, let's look at the numbers, and then they try to make the area that it fits in make sense to justify the numbers, right? And that's how you get in trouble. Whereas with self-storage, we do the opposite. We look at the area first, and if, if the area makes sense, then we actually start looking at the property. So those are the five things that we look at in general, which is and I'll, re I'll reiterate them. Number one, traffic counts. Number two, demand drivers and demographics. Number three, competition study. Number four, supply index, which is the supply and de demand analysis. And then number five is we actually look at the property analysis itself. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the uh, supply index. You kind of want to, you're looking for a number between three and five is okay. what you said. So is there any like general rule of thumb that you guys have as far as density is concerned? Not really. Um, when it comes, now this is, you know, goes into a little bit more sophistication. Once you start running deals over and over, you know, I've, I've probably looked at hundreds, if not a thousand self storage deals already. You start getting a feel towards, okay, does this make sense? Because we buy in multiple types of locations. We'll buy properties in rural areas where we want to see, you know, a supply index of maybe three or four, you know, super low. But then we'll also go and buy in, in, you know, urban cores with supply indexes of seven or eight, right? It just has to make sense for the area because you have to realize what goes into that number, right? It's net rentable square feet of storage available per capita. So if all of your population is living in high rises, de facto, you're going to have a much higher supply index number because per area you're going to have a much denser fit of people so we it's a sliding scale and the biggest thing we, we look at is is the competition at 90 percent or above and is there opportunity to raise the value of this facility by forcing appreciation over the next 12 to 18 months by dropping expenses increasing income uh adding additional square footage what have you okay so typically the just in general, after you've identified the market, your the play is a value add play. You mentioned like adding different services and things like you. Now you mentioned like U-Haul and things. So how exactly does that work? Yeah. So self storage is one of those things where it has multiple ancillary profit centers, right? You can do car, RV, boat storage. You can sell locks, renter's insurance, and you can get a premium cut off of the renter's insurance, moving supplies, packaging materials. You can set up a mini FedEx in your office, printing services, scanning services. You can rent space to cell phone towers, uh, billboard advertisements, wine stores, truck rentals, private mailboxes, right? So all those things that you can add as additional revenue streams, and it really depends on the area, right? So a super rural property that I buy, say, in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina, we're probably not going to offer all those profit centers, right? Because 
just needs to be no frills, self storage. But say something like a, a class A REIT grade facility that we're building for twelve and a half million, we're gonna we're gonna offer all of those services, right? So with, for example, uh, doing a, a contract with U-Haul, usually that's gonna take a lot more time, right? So you need to see if it makes sense on the payoff, if the income that you're generating is not being uh, canceled out by your increased employee cost to increase that, that income, right? And, that's, and it's basically you take a cut, right? It's, uh, it's just one of those types of services where a portion of the rental goes to you as the, as the operator that keeps those trucks serviceable and available for potential customers. So, uh, so in the case of U-Haul, it's almost like, it's almost like setting up a franchise location, but you're the one that's operating it, right? Not U-Haul. Right. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. So, so when you're looking, when you're looking at these deals, what are some typical like target numbers, uh, returns and everything that you're looking at right now at, at this point? Yeah. So it's funny cause where, where we're buying properties at as far as cap rates day one, it would be a multifamily owner's dream, right? So across our entire portfolio, we're at about a 9.3 to 9.6% cap rate day one. Mm -hmm. And then we usually will value add anywhere to a 12 to a 16% uh, once we decide to go for the cash out refinance. Um, we're usually walking into properties at a 1.2 to 1.5 debt service coverage ratio. And by the time we're done with the value add, we're at a 2.2 to a 2.5. Wow. So when you do, when you do the, uh, the cash out refi, typically like what's the timeline for that after acquisition? Uh, 12 to 18 months, depending on the severity of the value add, right? So the way that we do value add is it kind of in stages. So the very first thing we do is can we raise rents? We just look at all our competitors and if we see all of our competitors are charging 25 or 30 bucks more than us. Then the very first thing we do day one is we just jack all the rents up to street rates or maybe slightly below street rates, right? Maybe 95% of street rate just to capture all that value immediately, right? Because self-storage is a commercial asset. It's valued based off of its income producing potential, not what other self-storage facilities in the areas are selling for, which is why I love commercial real estate over residential. Um, second thing we look at doing in media is like, where can we drop expenses? Can we move from two managers to one and a half? Can we move from two managers to one manager? Can we install an automatic kiosk and go completely remote management, right? No, no on, on site staff. Um, can we get the property taxes contested to drop them down? Uh, can we drop insurance costs? Um, once we look at both of those, then after we've completed all those, then we start doing physical value adds. So we'll start, you know, maybe adding additional units or putting in a new gate or a keypad entry and exit, uh, maybe additional security cameras or security lights. All those things add value. It's forced appreciation. But obviously those things cost money. So we always try to do the value adds that don't cost any money in the beginning, you know, increase the marketing program, put, uh, you know, get, get a Google page so people can at least find our storage facility when they type in storage near Chicago, right? Um, and then we go to the physical value add afterwards. As far as the, uh, the management is concerned, I, I'm assuming, do you guys have like set up a central hub kind of for this? Correct. Yeah. So we have a management office mm -hmm. and then that management office manages all of the property specific managers that sit at locations. Some of our locations are manless. They have automatic. So for example, our, all of our properties, you can rent a property on your phone, on the website. Uh, if you give us enough notice, th there'll be a lock there waiting for you uh, with an unlocked unit. Um, that way it drops our management costs from anywhere, you know, 30 to $50,000 a year per the, so for some of these larger facilities down to, the cost of an independent contractor that once or twice a week, they just go, you know, unlock all the units they have to unlock, lock, you know, overlock all the units that are late, whatever you have. And it saves us quite a bit of money. 
but yeah, for the facilities that have a physical person on site, they are managed by a central office that we have. So what would you say has been kind of one of the biggest challenges that you've been faced with, you know, throughout this entire uh, investing career that you've had in self-storage? Yeah, it's, it's finding the money. You know, we're getting so many deals coming across our desk. Our acquisition team just crushes it. We're looking at usually 10 to 15 self-storage facilities a week. And we have to be really selective because of the amount of equity that's available to us. So in the last maybe 18 months, 16 to 18 months, we've purchased $10 million of self-storage facilities. We have another five under contract right now. Uh, we have another 30 in the pipeline that are looking like we'll put a contract on them. So because we don't have the capital right now, we haven't been raising capital just because the terms have been so good. We've been self-funding most of our deals. Um, that's our biggest hurdle right now. Uh, so what we've been doing is on some of these deals that are just so good, but we can't raise the capital in time, we just wholesale them to other investors. We just closed on a, a, a wholesale deal in Iowa. We got under contract at eight and a half, or eight, 800,000 and we wholesaled it to an investor at 1.032 million and we walked away from closing with a $232,000 assignment fee pretty good money for us. Yeah, that, like that. that yeah, I was going to say, you know, for for wholesaling, I mean, what are all these other guys doing out there wholesaling these singles and things like, you know? Yeah, <laughs> if single family wholesale deals, you're probably making anywhere between six to $10,000 net. Yeah. And that self-storage deal that we wholesaled maybe took 20% more time to do the underwriting, close it in 45 days, just like a single family guy would. Mm -hmm. We made 10 times the, the profit, right? Yeah. So what would be a piece of advice you'd have for people that are just looking into self-storage? Yeah. Uh, you'll start, as soon as you hear this podcast, I swear you're going to start seeing them everywhere. Just start making offers or even calling on them. You know, half of the time when you call these self-storage facilities, they're owned by a mom and pop owner. And usually when you call the front desk, it's the owner that picks up the phone, not just the manager, right? And just say, hey, are you willing to... Are you willing to sell your property? And then if they say yes, then at that point, get a hold of me or my partner and uh, we'll help you underwrite it. We'll even partner with you. You know, we'll find the debt. We'll find the equity. Uh, we'll help you do the underwriting on it. We'll help you manage it. We've done a ton of partnerships with other investors that are looking to get out of single family or multifamily into self-storage and they just need, you know, somebody to hold their hand on the first two or three deals. So it's very easy. Yeah. Just. To find me, you can, my social media handles are all like, I think it's the storage stud, the storage <laughs> stud. If you want to um, reach out to me personally, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you can also go to our website, uh, titanwealthgroup.com, sign up for our investor list. Um, there you can get opportunities to either participate in a deal uh, or if you have a deal and you want to send it to us, you could do it there as well. And we'll partner with you, help you set up all the pieces. Are, are there any good books out there related to self storage that you'd recommend? Yeah. So the, you know, like any other real estate investing avenue you go down, you're going to learn 10% of it from reading and going to seminars. You're going to learn the other 90% from actually doing it. So what we did is, our very first self-storage facility, I, we just operated the, that deal for a year before we decided to buy our second one. And then once we bought our second one, we bought another six in that same year, right? Um, so I'd recommend there's a couple of really good, we're going to be starting in uh, like a little course, creating a little course for it to help people out, especially on the wholesale side, a um, little education program. But until then, I would recommend Scott Myers. He's got a he's got a really great education course that teaches you the ins and outs of self storage, um, and then just get on bigger pockets and start talking to other self storage investors. Facebook has a bunch of Facebook groups uh, with self storage investors in them. They can bounce questions on and off, and even sometimes find deals. All right. Well, I really appreciate you know you sharing your 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 wealth of knowledge here with regards yeah. to self storage. I even picked up a bunch of uh, new information as well in this uh, in this episode because, you know, like I said, I'm I'm more familiar with multifamily than than self storage. But yeah, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing your information with us. 